All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to the cider workshop. I only know about cider in Berkeley. I was here one other time, so maybe one day I'll go to Santa Barbara, but we'll see. Um, so, so my my field is rock mechanics and structural geology and and kibitzing with geophysicists. Um, and um, one, of, one of the things that I'm going to try to do here today is that, you know, you're hearing a lot about convective instabilities and strength of the lithosphere and what makes plate boundaries and what makes the base of the plates and things like that. And, and a lot of the information about that comes from imaging and then combining that with geodynamic models. And so a key part of geodynamic models are what assumptions or parameterizations of rheology and strength you put into the model. And a lot of this comes from laboratory tests on samples which are a few millimeters in size. And, and you also have to run experiments on the time scale of a day to a week in order to accomplish anything. And so a giant question is, we have all of these models that are based on extrapolation in space and time of laboratory data, why should we believe this? And what, what are the reasons why we should believe it? And so what, what I want to do today is just spend a little bit of time um, providing some introduction, introduction of, of what the mechanisms that we study in the lab are, and then how we can test them by finding geologic examples where we can uh, constrain deformation parameters using combinations of petrology and microstructural observations. So I, if, of course, it, this is, this is a, a, a talk, but it's also partly a tutorial. And tomorrow, I'm going to continue in a more tutorial way to show you how to make some of the types of figures that rheology folks use, which are very helpful for kind of constraining some of the parameters you might be studying in, in projects along the way. So to begin with, um, Michael said, you have an equation on your first slide, but well, that's what we do. So we're, we're going to have to start with equations. Um, so these are, these are plots of laboratory data. And so in the laboratory, you can apply a, a known stress at a known temperature, pressure, and grain size of a rock with the known composition and measure a strain rate. And to parameterize this, we use what we call flow laws, but they're just rewriting of, if you like, it's rewriting of the Navier-Stokes equation in a different way. It's like a material science perspective. So you have strain rate, and it's related to stress. And so the ratio of stress over strain rate is viscosity. And this is just all the stuff that's hiding in a, a, a plot of effective viscosity or a, a parameterization of effective viscosity. And so, you know, this looks like a big mess. Um, and how do you interpret it? And what are we going to do to use it in the earth? And so as an example of what we're doing to use it in the earth, here's an experiment on olivine at a temperature of 1,250 degrees C. And here are little spots way up here. And what you need to do is extrapolate it way the heck down here. And, and, and to do that, you're like, well, how do you know that that really makes sense. And so what I want to do is help you get some intuition on what the heck these flow laws are and where they came from and, the, and how, how we extrapolate them. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time at the blackboard introducing some concepts. I, I don't know, for this, would it be helpful to just turn on the room lights rather than having the darkness? So this epsilon dot is strain rate. And there's a, there's a really simple formula called Orowan's equation where you say strain rate is equal to some parameters that are the dislocation density. And so I always like to ask here, how many of you guys know what dislocations are? 
you have to be like show put your like yeah I really understand what dislocations are okay and how many of you guys have no concept what dislocations are <laughs> all right a few of you all right so dislocations are defects in crystals and um, there's a kind of a cartoon that you would see in a structural geology class or an introductory um, mineral physics class or material science class. These are lattice planes. And in the lattice, there are defects where a plane of the, the lattice just ends, leaving this defect. And the defect isn't a spot. The defect is actually a line that comes out at you. And it's the motion of those defects which accommodates the strain inside of crystals. Um, and there's a whole bunch of theory, and you can take entire classes on the theory related to these things. But for the, for the points that are important for extrapolation to the Earth, what's important is what controls or limits the rate at which the, the dislocations can move through the crystals. And that's what this equation is telling us about. So, the, the strain rate is is related to how many of this these dislocations in there, or how much length of dislocation is in a crystal per unit volume. This thing B is called the Burgers vector, and it's basically the size of the crystal lattice, the spacing of the crystal lattice. And then the other important parameter, where all the kinetics is buried, is in how fast it can move. You apply a, a, a stress to a, a crystal or a rock, and under that stress, the dislocations can move at different velocities depending on what the temperature is or what the water content is. So let's first just get a little bit of insight into what this dislocation density thing is about. So, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, I'm going to get units to dislocation density in just a second. The units of Burgers vectors are just meters, and velocity is meters per second. So we'll talk about dislocation density right now. So a lot of you have probably seen a cartoon of a dislocation, which is an upside-down T, right? And so here is a little upside-down T. And now I'm going to start sticking a bunch of these in here. This is a cross-section through a crystal. Okay, so now what you should be, in your head, you should be envisioning a bunch of lines coming out at you. And what I'm going to do now is just dot in a little box with sides H. So what, what we can then define is a dislocation density, which is 1 per h squared. And, and this is then, in three dimensions, it's length per volume, which is 1 over meter squared. All right, now, what do you think controls the spacing h? If, I, if you look at this picture up here, basically what you're doing is dealing with a bunch of springs. The bonds are, are, are acting like Hooke's law. If I want to jam these things closer together, I have to apply a force. To get them closer and closer, I have to put a larger and larger and larger force. And so the spacing, H, is inversely proportional to stress. And as a result, rho is proportional to stress squared. This is the origin or, or the reason for the nonlinear viscosity. That, did Adrian, you, have you talked to him a little bit about that yet? A little bit. So, so when people, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about linear and nonlinear viscosity. So that this stress dependence of dislocation density is the origin of the nonlinearity in viscosity that you have probably read about at some point in your life. So what is it saying? It's saying the strain rate has a, this function with dislocation density, so the larger the stress gets, you have a nonlinear increase in the defect density in the crystal, so that makes the stress strain rate go up. <coughs> 
B is just a dimensional parameter. And then velocity is the, is the other important term here. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But do you kind of, kind of get the idea of what this dislocation density? Are you happy with that? Yeah, so, so it's a little bit complicated, but you have to have a mechanism to generate the dislocation. And, you know, if, if you were taking a class in this, I could, it would be a whole lecture on where these dislocations come from. And I don't want you to think that they're just magic and they appear from nothing. But the way they're generated is that you have dislocations in all different geometries in the crystal. And so as you push in one direction, some of the dislocations can't move, and they, they create these new defects that, that bow out. And I, 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 could, well, I can show you really quickly. Um, this is, you've probably, maybe some of you have seen cartoons of this. So here's, this is two dislocations coming out at you, and they're stuck. And there's a little line in between them. And if you apply a shear stress like this, this line will start bowing out. So this is a, a sequence with time. And then eventually, it will kiss. And after it kisses, it creates a dislocation line. Now this is, I hate always doing this because this gets into all kinds of complicated three-dimensional pictures. This is what the dislocation looks like in the plane of the line. So all the pictures that you're used to seeing like this are, are the cross-section. This is the line here, and this is the cross-section coming out at you. But I, I don't want to belabor this point, but this is kind of the mechanism how dislocations are generated. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I can talk to you more during the tutorial tomorrow night. No, I shouldn't have erased that. All right, so... Let's just go on to the, the next part of this equation is this V thing. So the velocity of the dislocation depends on what type of mechanism is happening. And so that's, again, a, a big subject. But for most situations in the asthenosphere and even in the base of the lithosphere, the velocity of the dislocation is going to be limited by a diffusive process. And to understand that, there's one other concept that's really important for understanding not only deformation, but diffusion. I'm going to stick my dislocation back in here. Is um, the other major kind of defect in crystals are uh, point defects or vacancies. And so this is what, you know, a lot of people have heard about um, dislocations, but how many of you guys have heard about vacancies in crystals? Yeah, maybe even more of you, huh? Okay. So the, the vacancy concentration which will denote with XV is related to pressure and temperature. And to give you some concept of what we're dealing with, these are now atoms. And if I want to create a vacancy, say I want to stick it in there, I have to break a bunch of bonds, and then I also have to distort the crystal structure. Okay? And the concentration of them, though, there's actually an equilibrium concentration of the vacancies that gets higher and higher at higher temperatures. And that's owing to the entropy of mixing, if you know about thermodynamics. So it's like if you have a crystal and nothing, the, the stable configuration is put some nothing into the crystal. And, and as a result of that, as you increase temperature, you put a higher and higher vacancy concentration in there. And that helps diffusion because the presence of the vacancy allows the d diffusion process to occur much more easily than if the vacancy isn't there. And so the, the concept of sticking the vacancies in there at thermodynamic equilibrium might seem strange, but it really helps you understand the effects of water on diffusion and the effects of oxygen fugacity on diffusion and things like that. Um, so, you know, the, this concept, and one of the things that really helped me understand it was when people actually have collected data, 
and you can do this now pretty easily, where if you take a crystal and you increase the temperature, you can measure the thermal expansion coefficient, and at the same time, you can measure the lattice spacing using x-rays. Those two things don't match each other, and the difference gets larger and larger with increasing temperature, and that's because the vacancy concentration is increasing. And so the other thing that's really important about the vacancy concentration is that it depends on the stress state or the pressure. And so X naught would be the vacancy concentration in the absence of a deviatoric stress. In this term, is a, a, a PV term, like an activation volume term. If you, if you have a high load, like around here where you're compressing the lattice spacing, you decrease the vacancy concentration. And down here, where you're kind of pulling the crystal apart, you increase the vacancy concentration. So the presence of the dislocation results in a state where the amount of vacancies very spatially. And what does that do? You have a concentration gradient of vacancies that drives diffusion. And so the concept is the dislocation is marching along. It runs into some obstacle. When it sits there for a while, that allows this diffusion process to occur. If you diffuse enough vacancies to this point, this thing can hop up. That's called dislocation climb. And then it can march on its way again. And so the key for the kinetics is here, is that this vacancy concentration is related to stress. And the vacancy concentration gradient is also proportional to stress. It's exponential in here, but if you work through the math, the differences in the vacancy concentration are small, so you can write it as proportional to stress instead of the exponential. Um, if you wanted to go through the math, I, I'd be happy to do that, but it's kind of beyond the scope of what I'm doing now. So the long run of this is this effect results in velocity being proportional to stress. So if you don't want to remember all this junk, just remember that. And so then in the end, we have strain rate is proportional to stress squared times stress. So that's stress cubed. And that's where this nonlinear power of three type of stress exponent comes from for, for high temperature creep. Okay? So, when you go back over here, the slope of this line is 3.5 plus or minus 0.3. And so the details, you know, there, there's actually people's whole careers, believe it or not, is really, they've really set out to say, is N3? or 3.5, or 5, or 7, or what is it? And, and so right now, let, let's not worry about that. But at least you now know what the origin of this nonlinear dependence is. And so the way to think of it is viscosity normally is just related to the, the ratio of stress over strain rate. But because of this thing, you have this added nonlinearity, which is, is important. OK. Now. I don't know if anyone talked about this, but I get to torture you for about another 10 minutes or so on the other major deformation mechanism. So how many of you guys know that if you go to... Yes, yeah, sorry, Bill. It would apply to the inner core. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more why it might be important in the, little, in the middle core in just a second. Um, and what's the grain size in the inner core? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Emily and Janelle in here, I think, have taken my class. And I think you guys actually did that as a homework assignment. Or maybe you didn't do it the year that I did it. But you know, if you calculate the grain size in the inner core from the kind of stuff that we do, you'll get 30 kilometers to something the size of the inner core. All right, and, and so, so why is that important? Well, 
what's the other deformation mechanism that we always talk about in the Earth is the linear viscosity mechanism or diffusion creep. And these data over here show this nice transition from a high stress exponent nonlinear mechanism to this linear mechanism. So this is occurring at lower stresses. And the reason why it's, the transition is occurring is this super high stress dependence of dislocation density is dropping the dislocation density down quite a bit. And then you switch over to another mechanism called diffusion creep. What the heck is diffusion creep? So if you have just a, if you're starting to build a little bit of intuition about what I'm talking about, now I can delve into just a slightly different way of looking at this vacancy problem and, and try to get you to have some intuition about diffusion creep process. That was a brittle failure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Whoa. It's like a $5 million room with a $20 whiteboard. <laughs> it's not quite on the thing. Is that good? Does it need to, need to rotate a little around, huh? Good. <laughs> High excitement. Okay. So now, continuing on our very sophisticated cartoons, now we're going to make an aggregate made of nine boxes or grains. All right, so now... What does diffusion creep mean? So we just learned that the, the vacancy, if you, have, if you want to remember about this vacancy concentration, you can kind of think, if I'm putting a high stress onto the crystal, this extra space is not going to be a happy thing. You can imagine elastic strains around the vacancy causing strain energy to increase around the hole. And so when you apply a load, that makes the vacancy concentration drop. So now let's think about applying a load to an aggregate at a larger scale. So you apply this load, and if you think about what's happening in the stress state, the kind of cartoon that you'll start to appreciate is that on this interface with a higher load, you'll have a lower vacancy concentration. These little spots are vacancies. Then under the face that has a lower load. So what's going to happen if I do this? This drives a flux of vacancies in that direction from high concentration to low concentration and a counterflux of cations and anions in the other direction. So as a result of that, I'm diffusing nothing to here and something to there. The crystal will change shape. But if I have a constant load, maybe due to bending of the slab or something, I don't get rid of this gradient, so it's always there. It's a, it's a persistent driving force that continues. So the crystal will continue to sh change shape. 
And that is the kind of the concept of diffusion creep. So you, the, the concentration of the vacancies, which are the defects, only depend on the stress. And that stress is also the driving force for the, the deformation. And the, the chemical potential gradient, or the gradient in the concentration, is over the size of the crystal. So that brings in the concept that's really important for diffusion creep, is that it's not nonlinearly dependent on stress, but it has this extra thing we have to worry about, is that it does vary with grain size. And so, again, the, the concepts here, I could then go on for another 20 minutes, but just to get an insight that the, the strain rate is going to be dependent on grain size is an important point here. And it turns out that when the diffusion process that limits this is, a, is by grain boundary diffusion, which for all geologic materials so far studied is the case, that the strain rate is proportional to stress and hugely non-linearly dependent on grain size. There's a cubic power here. Okay? And so really quickly, one, one, of the, one of the grain sizes comes from the link scale over which the, the diffusion is occurring. The other is just a simple way of saying the diffusion is causing a displacement rate of the crystal. To turn that into a strain rate, you just divide it by the grain size. So you get a displacement rate divided by a grain size, and that gives you a strain rate. And the last grain size comes from the fact that the, the flux is limited by diffusion along the grain boundaries, and, and therefore there's another size dependence, which is the thickness of the grain boundary relative to the grain size. But look at this. This now, you're like, oh, no. What? We need to know grain size within an order of a factor of two to constrain viscosity to an order of magnitude. So getting back to Bill's question, if the grain size is 30 kilometers or... 100 kilometers or one micron, that's a huge effect on viscosity. So if you go back over here, we, we go in the lab and we study these mechanisms and we know that this nonlinear one works and kind of intersects things down here. Uh, yes. <laughs> but the diffusion creep mechanism kicks in too. And depending on if the grain size is one millimeter or 10 millimeters, you intersect this thing at a reasonable viscosity or not. Okay? So that becomes an important question. And then that leads us to, well, which mechanism is more important and how do we figure out which mechanism is important? One easy way, and Maureen, are you going to talk about this at all? So one easy way is that, that, and I'll talk about this in a second too, when you have anisotropic minerals like olivine and pyroxene, the creep processes cause a lattice preferred orientation. And that ends up being a way, at least a signal, that you're deforming by dislocation creep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so that was where I said people spend their whole careers trying to figure out why it's 3 or 3.5 or 5. And so this is like one of these things, like, do I really want to tell you this or not? <laughs> um, so in the way things generally work, if you do a whole bunch of tests and you get something that's 3.5 plus or minus 0.3, you say, well, that's 3. And so I'm going to ignore the fact that it's 3.5 and just say that it's 3. If you ask me, I could, I, I'm actually writing an entire paper right now why it's 3.5 and not 3. But in, 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 in order to keep it simple for now, I'd rather not go into that just to not cloud things up. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, it's super important. And, and again, maybe we can get to that towards the end. Um, but in general, 
for, for the mechanisms that we think are important in the asthenosphere, for the steady state creep of the asthenosphere, and for a lot of the lithosphere, but not shear zones, the, the, the deformation on the boundaries is probably not important. For your business, it becomes everything. And so, um, but that, let, let's not get into that yet. So it, it might be something we can explore a, a little bit later on. All right, any other questions about this stuff? All right, so let's see how, uh, how far we get here. Okay, so in the, in the concepts now of trying to understand how we can trust these mechanisms, what, what I wanted to do is spend some time talking about microstructures and how we use these microstructures to test the laws that we've been talking about. So in, in lithospheric rheology, um, this, is a, this is a figure from one of Roland Bergman's review papers. You, you've probably heard about this controversy or debate about whether there's a big rheological contrast at the moho, it's like the jelly sandwich versus creme brulee versus banana split model is the <laughs> gastronomical um, vernacular for this. And so what I'm going to do is use this suite of observations from lithospheric rocks to look at whether this type of, which one of these rheological models is probably more correct. And I'll tell you they're all correct and it depends on the conditions of the deformation. But then we can also use this as a way to kind of help you maybe gain a little bit more of the insight in, into this. All right. So, the, the next thing that's important and, and why people like me can be employed is that while it seems preposterous to model lithospheric rheology based on something that's happening at a millimeter scale in a day as opposed to a thousand kilometer scale in a million years, is that these mechanisms that I just told you about are controlled by elasticity and diffusion. And so what we know about elasticity and diffusion is that they are not time-dependent nor space-dependent. So it, it, there's like a very first-order reason why we can trust these mechanisms. But the key is, in order to really trust it, you need to find some way to provide evidence that the process that you're activating in the lab is the same as the one that's activated in the Earth. There's some places where that's really easy, like a glacier. You can go out... You can actually run an experiment on ice at the conditions at the base of a glacier, and then you can look at an ice core and say, gee, look, these mechanisms are the same, so we can, that's simple. But in this case, you know, we don't have samples of the asthenosphere, so we have to do the best we can, just with looking at xenoliths and things like that. All right, so the, the trick we're going to use is to look at microstructures to, to help us gain this insight. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first way to do this, the, the, one of the major tools that we have to look at rheology is through the generation of um, lattice preferred orientations. And I, I, don't, I have to, uh, I showed up here this weekend, I haven't looked at the schedule. I know, Maureen, you're talking about this, right? Have you already talked about it? Okay. You're talking about it on Friday, okay. All right, so now why is this so important? So. Th Again, you know, you'll hear from Maureen, there's this and Torsten's here. This is a very complicated thing, understanding during deformation why the crystals all align in one direction. It's practical. It's a great tool for using seismology to interpret kinematics. But what I'm interested in is using the observation of anisotropy to infer more about dynamics or rheology. So this is an example of a shear zone from the Josephine peridotite. So here's some, this, you can kind of see in here these lines. These are uh, pre-existing foliation that's warped into this like 30 meter wide shear zone. So in the laboratory, you can take a millimeter slice of rock and you make a fancy test and you shear it a little bit. And then you look at the experiment when it's done 
and you use a technique to measure the orientations of the grains, and you make these plots that you've probably seen a number of times, which are pole figures. Um, the pole figures are telling you the, the spatial organization of different lattice planes in the crystal. So that's why it's called a lattice preferred orientation, unless you're from Europe, and then you call it a crystallographic preferred orientation. So one of the things you can see here is that because we have this pre-existing foliation, we can met, determine strain. And in the, in the laboratory, so this is the shear plane, and this is the foliation direction, which you can think of as the related to the strain ellipse. In the laboratory, the 100 direction of olivine rotates clockwise with increasing strain, and with a strain of about 200%, the olivine grains all line up in the shear plane. And so if this is some work Jessica Warren did, and you can see the same type of thing happening, the rotation of the 100 axis into the shear plane with increasing strain. So I look at that, and what I see is, in order to explain the LPO that you observe in the laboratory requires an incredible amount of work. And you know, here in Berkeley, Rudy Fank has spent you know, much of his career looking at this problem. It's very complicated, and it, it's still a state of the science issue of how exactly this happens. But the fact that the amazing complexity of deformation that's occurring in the aggregate results in the same evolution of LPO in the earth and in the lab is a super strong indication that the processes that we're activating are the same in the lab and in the earth. So it's, it provides a very strong justification for extrapolation of the lab data to lower stresses and lower strain rates. Now, Maureen will presumably tell you about this, but I'll, I'll provide just again a little bit of introduction. Now, it used to be 10 years, well, I guess 15 years ago, that understanding anisotropy was simple. And then um, Shun's group at Yale started running some experiments at higher pressures and higher temperatures and higher water contents, and suddenly all hell broke loose. So it turns out that what we thought we understood was a very simple interpretation of seismic anisotropy is pretty complicated, and it depends a lot on the stress state and the water content in the system. Now, why is this important, right? Well, the water contents that we're dealing with, and this, uh, this is always a thing where I like to tease geochemists, so I'll do it in just a second, but this is a plot of water content measured in moles versus stress. Geochemists don't like to use moles. They like to use weights of protons or weights of water in the crystals. So instead of... <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So, just so that you know, that we I, all the plots I'm going to show you are going to have, and not, not many of them are going to have water content in in parts per million of hydrogens per silicon. And and what's funny about this, the reason why I like to tease people is that what the a lot of geochemists do, I won't like blame all geochemists. They actually measure the number of hydrogens per silicons and then convert that into a weight percent. Um, and so <laughs> rather than just using the, that ratio, which would be what is interesting for us, right? Because we want to know how much water is there or how many protons are there. Um, but this is the water content. And the water contents that you would get in xenoliths or in, in other parts of the mantle will vary roughly along the x-axis. So now what the heck is all this crap? So depending in the laboratory what water content and stress state you run these experiments, you switch the orientations of these crystals. So I don't want to make this super mysterious, and Maureen will probably tell you a lot more about it, but I just want to make another plot over here to tell you what's going on a little bit without breaking the whiteboard again, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, so 
again, we're, we're going to look at a log strain rate log stress plot. So you know that olivine is elastically anisotropic, and that elastic anisotropy acts, also imparts a viscous anisotropy. So what it happens is if you look at single crystals, so if I take a single crystal and I orient it in the laboratory so that it has a B plane like this and an A direction like that, and I do this under dry conditions, and so we have to make things complicated, so we have this arcane way of writing that where the roundish brackets tell you a plane and the squarish brackets tell you a direction. The viscosity or the stress strain rate relationship for that orientation is much weaker than in one in which you try to get it to deform in the C direction. And this isn't a trivial difference. This is a factor of 100 times different. Olivine is orthorhombic, and so the other major direction, I'm going to just dash it in here, is have deformation on the C plane in the 100 direction. And if you spend too much time doing this, you start to get confused, but that's not a big deal for right now. So this is the easiest direction. And so the crystals deform fastest on when they're aligned like that. And those crystals rotate the fastest, and they align into the flow field. And that's why the LPO is dominated by this at dry conditions. When you add water, you enhance the strain rate. But you enhance the strain rate of this mechanism more. And so it switches. And this direction actually becomes the easiest direction. And as a result of that, the LPO changes from this thing that's referred to as A-type to E-type. So here's the A-type with the A-axis pointed in the shear direction and the B-direction perpendicular to the shear plane. E-type, it rotates differently so that the B-plane comes out at you. Maureen might tell you more about some of these other ones, but I'm just going to concentrate on these two right now. Note also, this is really important in this figure, if, you're, if you have this figure, that the sense of shear on this bottom one is different. So if you, to, to look at it here, look down here for a second. In the A type, you get clockwise rotation of the A axis. In the E type, you get actually counterclockwise rotation of the A axis. And one of the things that's important is that the A-axis never finds itself onto the shear plane. It always has this obliquity, even at high strain. So what I'm going to show you now is an example of shear zone. Yep? These are lab tests, right? So if you want to apply this to the earth, yeah. uh, there is a fault. Shall we consider any of the stress uh, getting um, OK, well, I'll show you. Um, let's see here. So what I'm going to show you now is some work that, that we, as an outgrowth of the stuff that Jessica did, um, that Jessica and Phil Skimmer have continued to work on. Um, Jessica was a, a postdoc at DTM, and she did some measurements of water content in, in crystals. And Phil was a postdoc working in my lab and, and measured some other shear zones in the same SC from the Josephine prototype. And what Phil found was 
evidence for this E-type fabric. And two important things are showing up here. One is, is that you see this switch where the B axis is coming out at you. And the other thing is, even at very high strains, strains up to 2,000 um, percent, or gammas of 20, he observed this switch where the A axis is now rotating counterclockwise and starts off flipped over on the other side. So if you see this, it's an exact replication of how the laboratory data show up when you added water. And what was cool is that when Jessica measured the water contents of these things, the ones with the E-type fabric plotted at this water content and the ones with the A-type fabric plotted at this water content. So this very subtle variation water content in, induced in the Earth the same transition is observed at the lab at the same differences in water content. And so these rocks are deforming, and you know, the estimates that we get are, are in the range of three to seven megapascals. So they're you know, at the base of the lithosphere type of conditions, and we see this transition occurring. So the reason why I went through that introduction was to say, you know, here again, not only are we seeing that the preferred orientation switches we're seeing that it switches at the same water content as you're imparting in the lab, which should give you a lot of confidence in both what the effect of water is on viscosity, which is maybe important considering the recent Nature paper that came out on the effect of water on rheology, and that the evolution of the LPO is also the very same way in the earth as it is in the lab when you've added water. So things change a lot. It's not like a subtle difference. You've really changed it a lot. And just to emphasize that, um, Phil wrote a paper where he showed this is kind of a combination of laboratory and, and lab data, or data from the Earth. The, the data I just showed you are these stars for, for the wet fabrics. And so they're evolving in, in this. So this is showing the angle of the 100 axis with shear strain. And so you can see... This has turned out to be a great tool for, for convincing us the importance of rheology, but it complicates the interpretation of seismic anisotropy a lot if you have low strains, and low being relative in the range of 100%. Depending on what your water content is, your interpretation of the kinematics can be off by 90 degrees. Yep. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. Where on the earth do we find these different Right. For example, Phil's study, there's two different areas that Yeah. So to give you an idea, if you if you take distribution coefficients that we measure in the lab for water between melts and minerals, the water content in the asthenosphere is in this range. And if you extract the water from melting, you'll zip over into this range. So a lot of the ophiolites and cratonic xenoliths show evidence of this type of fabric. And it's only in, in areas where there's good evidence that there was a relatively high water content where you start to poke over and get to this, this fabric. So do, let me see. Let me see if I can translate. 800, is, 800 in this unit is 50 ppm in olivine which translates to like 120 to 150 in the rock by weight. So, but, but you don't need a subduction zone to do that, is what you You don't need a subduction zone to do that, no. So the, these data suggest that the rheology in the asthenosphere would generally have this E-type fabric. And I don't know if there's geophysical evidence for that, um, but maybe Marine will. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I hope I partly answered Cheesy's question. What I didn't answer was why is the stress in the laboratory where we see diffusion creep so much higher than what in the Earth? Okay. So, I'm gonna let me see. I'll probably, I want to move on a little bit, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to skip a little bit and move on to that question. Right, before you skip on, yep. you 
Yeah. Did you want to comment any more? It seems to contradict what you just talked about. Yeah. Um, how about how about this? Is there a time later in the week where I could like we could have a discussion of that? With that, I could tell you very briefly what I think, and then I could elaborate ad nauseum about it. But very very briefly, what the experiments that the guys in Japan conducted were on forsterite at high pressure, and they measured the effect of water content on diffusion of silicon in in the forsterite. So there, there's two things that are important there. One is that it's on forsterite and not olivine, which seems like a trivial difference. There's no, essentially it's the iron-free end member. But what happens is that even though you're way over towards the forsterite end member in the earth, the presence of the iron dominates the point defect chemistry of olivine. So you, you're kind of... While it seems like you're doing the right thing in a simple way because you don't have to buffer oxygen, fugacity, and things like that, you change the defect structure a lot of, of the minerals. And, and the other thing, which is related to this why is N equal 3.5, is that our data suggests that the, the creep rate is not actually limited by silicon diffusion, but rather by uh, enhanced diffusivity of silicon along dislocation cores. And so... The, the mechanism that they're actually seeing is probably not the rate-limiting mechanism for creep. And so then the last bit, which maybe, maybe you'll have more confidence given what I just showed you, is that the water content variations with rheology are calibrated in the range of conditions where we see these changes in slip systems happening. So it, to impart that difference in, in internal deformation, you have to have an intracrystalline effect of water which is similar to what we see in order to get these changes in slip system happening. So that supports the kind of more conventional view of how water affects rheology. But if you want, maybe you know, it's a pretty important point given you know, what, how cratons form and things like that. So if you want, maybe we could spend more time later in the week discussing that. Is that? Yeah, we'll have time. There's a couple. Yeah, OK. OK. So, next point. All right, so a, a next scale observation, and this gets to Gigi's other question. So the short answer to your um, question, Gigi, is that in the laboratory, we make diffusion creep happen really fast by making the grain size teeny. So remember that the diffusion creep flow law depends on the cube of the grain size or one over the cube of the grain size. So by making these powders with a one micron grain size rather than a one millimeter grain size, we enhance diffusion creep by nine orders of magnitude approximately. Okay? So in the earth, the grain size isn't one micron. Um, and so as a result, in that plot I showed you with a grain size of one millimeter to 10 millimeters, the transition stress is more like one MPA to 10 to the minus three MPA. All right. And so how would you start to study that? One way is to look at evidence of seismic anisotropy, and the other way is to maybe look at stuff like this, which are geodetic data after an earthquake. All right. So... This, this is from a study of Andy Freed, which was based on a lot of work that Andy had done in collaboration with um, Roland Bergman and Tom Herring over the years to try to figure out how you can use geodetic information to put further constraints on crustal and mantle rheology. So the, the key here, this is related to the um, post-seismic creep after the Hector Mine earthquake. And the, and the Landers earthquake as well. And the key to Andy's analysis is that you're seeing some of this post-seismic deformation pretty far away over in Nevada. And when he models this, he finds evidence of... The, because it's far away, it has to be relatively deep. So that puts the deformation into the mantle. And by looking at the time evolution of the data, he gets an added constraint on the, the rheology. 
And these are, this is just examples of the kind of curves that you would look at. So the observed line is this black thing. And when you're dealing with this type of deformation, this actually gets more into the kind of stuff Doug was, is studying in seismic attenuation. But you're dealing with a transient. You put a load on it, and then it evolves to a new strain rate. We know from laboratory data that this transient viscosity can be much, much smaller than the steady state viscosity. And this is an example of a lab test where this is the stress here, constant stress of 400 megapascals, and this is the strain. So the slope of this line is the strain rate. And so the first little increment of time, the slope here is about a factor of 10 larger than the slope at the end of, of, the, of this situation. And so what Andy did was he took advantage of this type of analysis in addition to the olivine flow laws and found that these really subtle variations in the stress exponent mattered in terms of fitting the data. There's a lot of adjustable parameters here, so this isn't proof of a, of a stress exponent of 3.5 because there's another term in here that's important is what's the magnitude of the, of the transient viscosity. But in the end, you know, he, he has two really important parts of the data set are how the strain is evolving with time and what the overall magnitude of displacement is. And so he gets a pretty tight constraint on, on possible parameters that would, would give you that. And so, what's that? Yeah, uh, it doesn't say up there. It might be on the next plot. So this gives you his background condition that he needs to make it to work. So this is a plot of stress versus grain size. And this is called a deformation mechanism map. And this is what the tutorial, one of the things we're going to do is teach you in real time to make a plot like this. So what this is showing is stress versus grain size. And this line is the transition. So if you're at a constant stress and you increase grain size, you'll move from a diffusion creep into the dislocation creep field. Or if you're at a constant grain size and you decrease stress, you'll move from a dislocation creep into the diffusion creep field. So this is, effect, this is the effect of the stress dependence and dislocation creep and the grain size dependence on diffusion creep put on the same plot. So the background stress that Andy gets for the mantle, and it's in the range of 60 kilometers, is something in the range between 0.7 and 0.3 megapascals. And if you use our estimates of what the grain size in the mantle is for that condition, you would get something like 10 millimeters. That's 60 kilometers. So that's well into the dislocation creep field. And as an example, then, if you look at xenoliths from the basin and range, this is from a paper of Mercier, at a depth of around 60 kilometers, you're seeing xenoliths with grain sizes in the range of 8 to 12 millimeters. And the other important parameter is the water content. And this is maybe not as well constrained, but here's a paper by Lee and others showing evidence for water contents in the, in, in the range of, um, it depend, this is a, a little bit complicated because there's a, an issue of when you measure the water content of olivine, you've probably lost, lost some of the water because rapid diffusion of, of water out of the system. But pyroxenes have a much more sluggish diffusivity of, of water because there's a, a charge coupling between the trivalent cations in the structure. And as a result, the pyroxenes preserve a, a higher water content. And as a result of that, you need to understand the partitioning of water between olivine and pyroxene. And if you do that for the, the rocks from Dish Hill, which is in, in the area near where the post-seismic creep is being measured, you're getting water contents in the range of 20 to 30 in terms of weight PPM, which Roberta would tell you is, is something like 500 mol H per 10 to 6 silicons. So that's cool. So you have this independent way of monitoring the rheology of the mantle. This is not, this is a little, this is not a, a exact test of the viscosity. It's a test of the viscosity. 
but using the constraints from the lab, it fits the data from what the grain size is, and it also fits the observation that you have a nonlinear creep response in that part of the mantle. So you get both the right magnitude of viscosity, the right magnitude of stress, and the right grain size and the right water content. Yeah? It's the mantle background stress. Yeah. So this is this is the range of the mantle background stress in the that's being modified by the, the... And one way of thinking about this is a really important thing, is that in order to see a post-seismic creep response, the change in stress has to be some sizable fraction of what the background stress is. So say the stress was 100 MPa, and you change the stress by 1 MPa. You don't do anything. So part of what Andy is seeing is that in the lower crust... That, that's maybe what's happening. Maybe the stress is like 40 MPa and you change the stress by 1 MPa. So there's not a big effect. But where the stress is lower, the stress change from the earthquake is lower the deeper you go. But the magnitude of background stress is also much lower, so the ratio actually gets bigger and the effect becomes important. Yeah, the lithosphere is in the range of 50 kilometers or so in there. Yeah. It's super sensitive to the temperature. So why do we feel that this is good though? Um, That's a very tweakable parameter. It's a very tweakable parameter. Um, what that so, so we know we have independent constraints on temperature from heat flow and from seismic velocity. Um, so if you put those together, the geotherm that matches these data is the same one that Yang and others have inferred based on the seismic velocity and heat flow from, from this region. I think I sh that shows up. I glossed over it quickly. So this is the range in geotherms that Andy studied. And the only one that matched is this hotter one. And this is kind of showing this, the lithospheric thickness here, Torsten. So this difference in, in, in temperature is enormous in terms of viscosity. So if the temperature was this low, you wouldn't be able to see the response that you do. That's right. That's right. So if you want to see in it, if you want to, one way of thinking about that in a plot and this would just be for constant temperature for a nonlinear creep rate. So instead of doing a log log plot, I'll just do a linear plot. So if, if you're out here and you change the stress a little bit, a teeny bit, you don't know. If you're here and you change the stress just a little bit, or here and you change the stress a little bit, it's not going to really do much. But if you're here and you change the stress by a factor of two, then you would do a lot to the steady state creep response. And there's a transient on, on top of that. But if you're out here and you change the stress by... I should have done this in a log log plot. Sorry about that. If you change the stress by 1 MPa out here, it doesn't move you very far, whereas 1 MPa over here moves you a lot. If this is 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's why I should have done it on a log plot. But I'm sure that helped you immensely. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so, all, so what I've, now let's just recap. Nonlinear creep is nonlinear because of this dislocation density stuff. It imparts a lattice preferred orientation, which we can see both by looking at rocks and by looking at seismic anisotropy. Uh, 
we know about a mechanism that can occur at lower stresses because we can excite it in the laboratory because we can cheat by making really, really fine grain rocks. When we look at natural rocks from higher temperatures, we see the lattice before orientation evolution the same as in the lab, and we see evidence even from larger scale things like post-seismic creep, or if you like, even larger scale things like lithospheric scale instabilities and things like that, that you have a dislocation creep mechanism near the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. So then the question is, where is diffusion creep important? I'm not going to talk about that right now, but it's super important in two places. One is deeper in the mantle, and one is in high-stress shear zones. So that, it, would, it would take a while for me to go into all that stuff, but those are two places where it's important. And so what I want to do in the remaining 20 minutes, while you maybe have just a little bit of attention span left, is talk a little bit about crustal rheology, because there we can see, again, a, a nice correlation with deformation mechanisms where we see a lot of evidence for diffusion creep processes occurring. Yeah, Claude? Right. Right. So, um, yeah. So there's. The. He he's asking about are there conditions where, where, the dislocation glide is more important than dislocation climb, and so I'm going to draw my upside down T cartoon here. So if you look at dislocations in crystals, the, the spacing of the dislocations might be in the range of 1,000 unit cells, something like that. So the, the, the idea is that this process is, the glide process is very sim simple. And if you get rid of this obstacle by diffusion or if the dislocation climbs, this guy can then zip to here and this guy zips to here. And that process happens almost instantaneously. So in order for a glide to be limited, you need to change the conditions such that the glide of the dislocation on each lattice plane is the important step. And so there's two ways of doing that. One way is to make diffusion much, much more difficult. And so one way of making diffusion much more difficult, which we we alluded to earlier, is by going to higher and higher pressure. That, that's the origin of this term that you've probably heard of, the activation volume of creep. You go to higher pressures, it makes the formation of those vacancies harder and harder and harder. You get fewer and fewer and fewer of them. Diffusion slows down, and it's possible that you move into a mechanism where that process becomes rate limiting, the glide process. And that's some of the work that Patrick has, has done. He's also looked into, there's kind of, it's like one of these things of uh, our, our community and rock mechanics borrows heavily from material science. And material science, um, it's actually kind of interesting. A material scientist, Hans Wiertman, started studying glaciers back in the 50s. And it's the inter his interpretation of what was happening in glaciers was really kind of a, a, a highlight of how to scale the difference between bending paper clips to mantle convection kind of problems. But, you know, geoscientists are always, you know, I would say like in the 70s and 80s, were always kind of taking material science and borrowing it and then applying it to their science. Now, there's a little bit of the things, things are switching a little bit. Geomaterials are way more complicated than most material science materials. Like, you know, metals and simple ceramics have very simple chemical compositions and simil, sim, relatively simple crystal structures. Plagioclase and 
pyroxene are hideous materials. So as a result of that, when we apply some of the material science ideas, they just don't work anymore. And Patrick has been on the vanguard of figuring out things like that. And, and so one of the things that's, one of the new things on the vanguard in material science are these things called dislocation cascades or avalanches. And they were discovered in ice, I think, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so what happens is that instead of being limited, I mean, this is, you should never have asked this question. <laughs> but instead of being limited by a diffusion process, under some conditions, you can just have a pile up of these dislocations, and they can just blast their way through here. And once that happens, about 10 of them can run through all at once. And so that's, that's one possibility of what's happening deeper in the Earth. So the question is then, you know, how would you test that? And, and so that's kind of stuff that Adrian, Gigi, and Torsten can look at. Like, what is seismic anisotropy in the base of the olivine stability field? What is the evidence for seismic anisotropy in the lower mantle? What's the viscosity that you get from convection models or the interaction of slabs with the lower mantle? How much larger is the viscosity in those regions? And those, those are the ways that we're going to test that. And there's a one, it's like for the lab people, there's an issue in that the tricks that we can use to make deformation occur get harder and harder and harder the higher the pressure you get. Because of this effect of pressure, the stresses that you need to apply to get any creep at all get higher and higher and higher. And when you start applying larger stresses, you get higher dislocation densities and these problems get exacerbated. So the, the issue right now is how do you run longer experiments at super high pressures where you need fancy equipment on the beam line to interpret what's happening. And so that, that's kind of an interesting dilemma in our field right now, which is, I guess, kind of being solved by some neat stuff that Don Widener's doing. All right. That was a fun tangent, but we'll, we'll try to do, cover one more thing here. I'm trying to think which, which thing to do. Um, one option, do you, th do you guys still have enough stamina to last for 10 more minutes? Yes, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me um, talk about this stuff. So in crustal rheology, the big issue is we've changed material. And, and lower crustal rheology is dominated probably by gabroic rocks, so gabros and amphibolites. They're dominated by the hideous mineral plagioclase triclinic mineral with complicated crystal structures. And so our understanding of, of plagioclase is just rudimentary compared to our understanding of olivine. A lot of our understanding of it is only empirical. So, you know, unlike olivine where we can do fancy experiments and hypothesis testing and prove it to be correct, with plagioclase we're still at a condition where we're doing empirical science of squishing it, looking at dislocation density, looking at strain rate stress relationships and uh, providing a, a law that you can extrapolate. So the business that I was telling you about of needing some way to verify the applicability of the flow laws is even more important for crustal rheology than it is for mantle rheology. What's that? Um, in the mid-crust, it's probably dominated by crust or by quartz, but as you go down um, into the lower crust, you lose the fraction of quartz that you have and you increase the fraction of plagioclase. So in granite, even though there's 30% quartz, it probably dominates the rheology at moderate strains. Whereas in lower crustal rocks, you might have 5 to no percent quartz and uh, it's not as important phase anymore and plagioclase dominates. So the rocks I'm going to show you came from an oceanic core complex on the Indian Ocean. So here's a transform fault on the Indian Ocean, and here's the ridge axis. There's this giant mountain belt over here. You can see how giant it is. Here's the, goes from, what is this? From like 6,000 meters below sea level to about 500. So it's a, like a 5,000 meter mountain. 
and that the whole thing is made out of gabbro. And drill holes into there from ODP preserve, bring up these rocks that are really cool. They have beautiful microstructures indicating deformation in the lower crust. And what's really helpful about them is that because they deformed at a mid-ocean ridge under a very, very high thermal gradient, they're quenched. So they're only at high temperatures for a very, very short amount of time. And the other thing that's nice is that the petrological aspects of pyroxenes and gabbros gives you a very good way of determining temperature. And then you can also look at the deformation microstructures to uh, check on the, the flow laws. So this is just an example of a, a lower crustal deformation zone. The dark stuff is pyroxene, and the light stuff is plagioclase. This box is this thin section here. You can see the plagioclase is all recrystallized. Pyroxene is also recrystallized, and you get these fine-grained bands of pyroxene and plagioclase. So the pyroxene, the 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 uh, the the large porphyr class of pyroxene are exolved uh, because the, the calcium content of, of the pyroxene changes as a function of temperature. And they're recrystallized into little augite grains and little orthopyroxene grains. And you can use that um, petrology. We, we know very well for, from these kind of conditions how the concentration of calcium in diopside and instatite vary as a function of temperature. And so you can use these type of microstructures to get the temperature of deformation where these little grains formed. And, and that's in the range of 800 to 950 degrees C, which is a, a granulite. So this is like a, a, a lower crustal rock in the continent under a pretty high geothermal gradient. Um, and that there's another thing that we'll talk about during the tutorial that you can relate stress to grain size. There's an inverse relationship between stress and grain size. These are just examples from myelinites and lab data and, and peritite xenoliths where you see a variation in grain size that indicates a pretty broad range of stress. These things are well calibrated. There's some debate on how to extrapolate them, which we'll talk about. But we can at least use them as an estimate of stress. And the other cool thing about the oceanic rocks is that because they cool quickly, you can also constrain strain rates in a kind of a unique way. Um, so this is from a paper from Bobby John. The rocks that are crystallized have zircons in them, so you can measure the time when they were, were crystallizing at high temperatures in the range of 1,000 degrees. And then you also can measure um, argon-argon dates and biotite, look at the magnetic signature, which is quenched in at the Curie temperature, and even fission tracks and whatnot. And so you see there's this very, very rapid cooling associated with the high thermal gradient. And since the deformation occurred only in this high temperature window, you know that there's a very limited time where it could have been at high temperature. And you also know that the strain is pretty high and to give you an idea, here's a circle, and there's a circle strained 300%, and here's one strained 1,000%. So the deformation here is, is, is pretty clearly greater than even 300%. And the time is clearly much less than a million years. So we know that the strain rates are much greater than 10 to the minus 13, and they're probably much more on the order of 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 12. So very rapid strain rates in the, in the shear zone. And it's a pretty solid foundation for that. So we have temperature, stress, and um, grain size, and strain rate. So we have everything we need to test the flow laws for plagioclase. And again, this is important just because, as I was saying, that the flow laws are really empirically based. So the other thing that's really cool is in these rocks that the plagioclase, in the bands that are north acidic or just plagioclase, has a strong preferred orientation. Whereas in this mixed stuff, the deformation results in a mixing of the pyroxene and the plagioclase. The plagioclase has no preferred orientation or very little one. So you see two things. There's preferred orientation in the coarse grain stuff, no preferred orientation in the fine grain stuff. And the fine grain stuff also is mixed of plagioclase and pyroxene. There's also, 
this is, this is really important for evolution of, of rheology, is what is the role of the second phases on viscosity? So what I just showed you is that the grains were fine-grained, the rock was fine-grained where there was two phases together. So what's happening, if you mix the phases, the grains might want to grow, so thermodynamically they might want to grow to be larger, but they're stuck because there's someone in the way. And th this is, you might hear the, the vernacular is Zener pinning is a, a word for that. And Zener pinning has a, a, a nice formula, and basically what it says is if you have more of a second phase and that second phase is smaller, that the grain size is pinned to be a smaller value. This, this was worked on a lot in the material science community because of a, wanting to create really fine-grained, strong ceramics if you, if you wanted to put them into weird shapes in, while you were processing them and you didn't have a way of keeping the grain size fine, then when you were done with it, the thing would crack and break. So you wanted to do something to make it fine grain, and a lot of work was done to say, well, you know, if you mix a second phase in there, that keeps the grain size fine, and then we can do all kinds of amazing stuff. It's something that the samurais figured out a long time in, 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 in making their, their swords just by luck. They didn't know what they were doing. But when they made those amazing swords with the super sharp blades, what they were doing was using a little, there was a little bit of carbon on the grain boundaries that was pinning the steel. So they could form it at high temperatures that when it cooled, it would hold a blade really strong. So the, the earth does this for us, and it, and it has an important effect on the rheology, similar to what's observed in the lab. And so I'll just finish up with this plot. So we know some indication of the stress. We have some indication of the strain rate, and that puts us in this box. And then we have our empirical flow law, which is stress-dependent, grain size-dependent, temperature-dependent, and pressure-dependent. So we know, just to review, that the, the bands that were just plagioclase look like they deformed by di dislocation creep, and they had a strong preferred orientation. So this is anorthite flow law. This is the nonlinear part of it, and it goes right through the box. We also know that the finer-grained rock that was a mixture of pyroxene and plagioclase deformed apparently by diffusion creep, by the lack of the preferred orientation that formed. So this is the linear portion, when you make the, the grain size finer, that makes the strain rate by the linear portion go up. But the addition of pyroxene makes dislocation creep hard. So you've inhibited dislocation creep and enhanced diffusion creep. So you get this magical condition where the fine-grained gabbro deforms by diffusion creep and the coarser-grained plagioclase deforms by dislocation creep. And what's cool is that really only happens at the stress and strain rate that we independently characterize for the rock. So, you know, you're just like, well, are you sure that that's not a circular reasoning? It's like, well, it's not circular reasoning. It's, we independently have estimates for these parameters that don't have anything to do with the rheology. And the place at the stress and the stress and the strain rate where this happens is predicted by the empirical laboratory flow law. So it's a really good indication of giving you confidence in the extrapolation of, of the empirical law. And just to demonstrate that, if, if the stress was larger, well, there's one other thing that's important, is that the fine-grained rock, is the strain is localized into the fine-grained rock. Let me quickly, in the last minute, just show you that. It's pretty remarkable, right? So here's, here's just a few millimeters away. Here's, this is one millimeter. The, the sample's not really deformed very much, but in the fine grain rock, the, the strain rate is way higher. So the other observation that's, that's supported here is that the coarse gabbro has a much lower or much higher viscosity than the fine grain stuff. So you see strain localization, dislocation creep in the plagioclase, diffusion creep in the mixed stuff, at a strain rate that we see independently from thermal chronology, if the stress was lower, you wouldn't get the strain rate you need. If the stress was higher, all these flow laws munched in together because the stress dependence of dislocation creep gets rid of the diffusion creep component.
So I know that's kind of like a complicated thing, but for someone like me to be able to see all of that converge to be a one condition where this all happens is really compelling. And it, and it gives me confidence in the extrapolation, which if you remember from 20 hours ago, remember that the extrapolations shouldn't depend on time or space, but they do depend on deformation mechanism, but our interpretation of all these microstructures that we can collect and constrain using all the amazing new analytical techniques available to us <laughs> provide super strong support for where the flow laws are applicable and it matches. And so the postscript is, this is only the beginning of the story. All I've done is shown you that the flow laws really apply in the Earth, but how important they are depends on models that take into account variation in parameters. And so one, one of the things that I would just finish with is, if you run a model and you get an observation that doesn't fit where you use these rheologies, you should say it's not because the rheology was wrong, it's because something is modifying the rheology or some assumption that we're making might not be addressed correctly or a different mechanism that I haven't looked into yet is actually important. And that's the, the way I use, would think about using that information. So that's all. <laughs> At the same uh, PT stress field or at different condition? So, okay. Um, so glide, the glide mechanism is where, where the dislocation is stuck at each lattice position and that can hop across one. So in, in the conventional wisdom, that happens at lower temperatures where diffusion is slow and you're forcing the dislocation to hop over to the next lattice position. As you increase temperature, that barrier gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually it's not important anymore, and the dislocations can glide freely, but then they get stuck on some other obstacle which climb takes care of. So Claude was just pointing out there are some new data that indicate that that kind of conventional wisdom might not be so simple under some conditions in the Earth, and then I went off on a tangent that I shouldn't have. <laughs> Can I ask you another question? Yeah. You were mentioning that it's critical to uh, when you do a model and that uh, something doesn't fit. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the uh, energy uh, budget? Uh, if you are doing other thermal experiments, that's fine. But if you do especially a, a shear zone problem or the relaxation post seismic, uh, yeah. how likely is the isothermal uh, approximation to be wrong? And could it, right. would it be, wouldn't it be better to use an adiabatic uh, thermodynamic pass? That's right. So that's a hugely important question. And so it gets to one way of thinking about problems is that it might be better to think of things at constant energy dissipation rather than at constant stress. Um, and in the laboratory, um, we can do that. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because the a lot of the furnaces that we use are much easier to control temperature than sometimes power. So sometimes, and, and so as a result, it's easier to do isothermal conditions. Um, and also, because, and, and part of that is because when you're in the lab, you're forcing all of this high temperature into a really teeny little area. And so there's big thermal gradients outside of where your sample is. And so if you aren't controlling on temperature using a thermocouple, then it's, it's harder to, to constrain what's really happening. So that's one of the reasons we do the things the way we do. In terms of where it's important to track dissipation rather than temperature, the two places where it becomes critical are in shear zones. That, that's basically the main one where it's important. So when the, when the stress gets bigger and the strain rate gets correspondingly bigger, the feedbacks on, on dissipation become enormously important. Um, I, Janelle Homburg's here, she did, worked on some of that for some work. We're looking at where that adiabatic condition might take off and, and, and strongly affect where strain localizations occurs. In the asthenosphere, 
I don't think it's probably super critical. In the lithosphere where it's not localized, the strain rate's probably low enough where it's not critical. But in shear zones, in the lithosphere, say in the temperature range between 600 and 900, it probably is important. So if you're running a model, the flow law is still applicable, but you have to account correctly for dissipation rather than just... Um, you, need to, you need to account in, your th in the way you control temperature with dissipation. That's basically important. So... Um, Craig, uh, and, uh, I guess my question is actually about this transient uh, rheology that uh, I guess Andy Freed introduced in his study. Yeah. Um, that's just yet yet another free parameter uh, that actually uh, kind of makes me really worried about. Um, so I guess if you look at the, the kind of things, the process that we learn about Earth's rheology from the observational point of view, you have a glacial rebound. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the strain rate or strain, the total strain from the rebound is actually pretty small. I mean, yeah. right? And also, this, trend, this uh, postal seismic deformation, that's even minuscule compared even to glacial rebound. Right. Um, but this is really about, this is how we learn about Earth's rheology. I mean, you, we use the, the mantle rheology inferred from, you know, post glacial rebound to study mantle convection, we compute the random number and all that. Right. If you were, now you are saying that uh, you guys study this uh, steady state creep uh, deformation, uh, whereas, uh, uh, I guess you know one key question to me is how we're going to kind of uh, take rebound study, post glacial rebound study, then and and then apply that to the Earth. Should we should we say that maybe you know a rebound visco rebound you know, uh, uh, viscosity estimate from rebound is like a, a fact of ten or hundred times smaller than uh, or, you know than the real Earth? I mean, can yeah. you comment on that? Yep. Yeah. So so the the transient rheology. Um, the, there, there's two things that are important. The, the size of the transient depends on the mechanism that you're activating, so whether it's the diffusion creep or dislocation mechanism. And, and we're, we're really still in a pretty early stages of, of figuring out all the things that are important. And so in answer to your question is that you should keep your eyes open for deformations that are very small. So the post-seismic creep is an example of where, it, where you might be not constraining the, the steady state viscosity at all, but to see this transient, you need to, that puts some bound on what the steady state can be. So the way, wh the way I would look at it is start to look at the, the myriad of different styles of deformation you get, the stuff you're looking at, like at plate bending or um, lithospheric instabilities where the strains are much higher, um, and apply the you know start with that, and then when you're dealing with the transient rheology, acknowledge that that the the transient might be as much as an order of magnitude lower viscosity. So it, if you look at diffusion creep mechanisms, the transients are much smaller effect. It's more like factors of two, and so it's only in the dislocation creep field. In, 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 it goes back to the very first stuff that I was talking about. It's like, well, how, what's the important thing in dislocation creep? It's strongly dependent on the dislocation density. How do you vary that? You don't vary it when you have a strain of 10 to the minus 6. So in the diffusion creep field, the vacancy concentration isn't varying like that as much. So the transient is much more modest. So glacial rebound is sensitive to the viscosity structure over 1,000 kilometers, roughly. So the dislocation creek part is only in the upper 300 kilometers. So you're probably okay for most of what it's seen um, in orders of factors of two. But.